This is session number eight. Session number eight, and now we're starting the new chapter. This is called Pacheya Sangaha Vibhaga, the compendium of conditionality. Okay, so the text begins by saying, I shall now explain here in a fitting manner the detailed analysis of the conditioned states, the conditioned phenomena, and of those states which are their conditions and of how they are related. And so the key word in this chapter is the word pachaya. Which is what we translate as condition. And the word pachaya comes from the verbal root I, which means to go. And then it has a prefix pati, which one of the senses is back to. So that which goes back to, in the sense of that which relies upon. And so that which something relies upon is its condition. And though we use the word pachaya as conditioned, and then when we have paticca samupada, we translate dependent origination. So you don't see from those renderings, you don't see very clearly that the word pachaya and the word paticca are actually derived from the same, have the same origin from pati plus the verb I. So we could say that maybe if we use pachaya for condition, so we might render paticca samupada conditioned origination. And in understanding conditionality, there are two things to be understood, actually three things to be understood. One is the condition itself, that which functions as a condition for something else. And the second is the second is that which arises through conditions. Technically, this is called So dhammas here are phenomena. Upana means arisen, and pachaya is conditions. So that which, those things that have arisen through conditions. Then the third thing to understand is how the condition is a condition for the things that arise through conditions. Because many things can be conditions for one particular phenomena, but they are conditions in different ways. For example, in the suttas, it said, in dependence upon or conditioned by the I and forms, I consciousness arises. So the I and the forms are conditions for I consciousness. I consciousness is something that arises through conditions. But the I and forms function as conditions for I consciousness in different ways, not in the same ways. We don't see the I, but we see forms. 
And we don't see through forms, but we see through the eye. And a condition supports the condition phenomena in either of two ways, or in some cases, in both ways. That is, a condition supports the arisen entity in causing its arising or promoting its arising. And the second way is in sustaining that which has already arisen. And then the condition can relate to the condition phenomena in different ways. And one of the distinctive, the special features of the Theravada Abhidhamma is the development of a scheme of 24 conditions which explain how conditions relate to the condition phenomena. Okay, under the, this chapter on conditionality, the text explains, here I'm on page 293, that the compendium of conditionality is twofold. That is, the method of dependent arising, dependent origination. This is Paticca Samuppada. And the other is called the method of conditional relations. And then the text will go on to state that the method of dependent arising is marked by the simple happening of a state in dependence on some other state. That is, the method of dependent origination just says, in dependence upon X, Y arises. In dependence upon A, B arises. But it doesn't explain how A is a condition for B. So that's why it's called the mere the simple happening of a state in dependence on some other state. Okay, the second division of conditionality, the method of conditional relations, this explains, well, this is discussed with reference to the specific causal efficacy of the conditions. That is, it elaborates all the different ways in which the condition serves as a condition for the dependent phenomena. Okay, now we're going to treat first the rest of today, dependent origination, and then I think tomorrow we take briefly the method of conditional relations. Okay, so we have first the expression dependent origination, which is we have here the word paticca, which means going back to, relying upon, depending upon, conditioned by, plus samuppada. And the word samuppada suggests, I call it the idea of, or I translated it as origination, but it suggests the idea of, what I call it a complex arising. 
there's been a common translation or way of explaining dependent origination as interdependent arising. Strictly speaking, not correct. Because samuppada doesn't mean that everything is interdependent. In some relation of some factors, there's interdependence. But in relation to other factors, the conditioning relationship doesn't go both ways. Like birth is a condition for old age and death, but old age and death is not a condition for birth. So it's not the case that all the factors are mutually interdependent, and the texts never explain it in that way, but always in dependence upon this that arises. Okay, then underlying dependent, the formula of dependent origination, there is a, what I call the abstract principle of conditionality. We find this stated well, a number of times in the suttas, imasmin sati idang hoti imas upada idang upajati. Imasmin sati, when this exists, that comes to be. With the arising of this, that arises. So that's the Maybe we can call this the structural principle of dependent origination, the arising of one thing in dependence upon another. And so this principle of conditionality can be applied in many different ways, but the Buddha in the suttas applies it, the principal application is to a 12 fold formula or a series of 12 terms because the Buddha's teaching has the practical aim of liberation from the cycle of birth and death. And so what the Buddha aims to do with dependent origination is to show what is the chain of conditions, the network of conditions that are responsible for bringing about birth and death and for sustaining the cycle of birth and death. And he does this in order that one can trace the sequence of conditions back in order to remove the fundamental underlying roots of the cycle of birth and death. And so we see that the Buddha sometimes in the suttas and some places, he highlights the discovery of dependent origination as the key to his enlightenment. So he says, for example, this is in Sangyutta Nikaya, chapter 12, sutta number 10. He says, before my enlightenment, while I was still a bodhisattva, it occurred to me that this world has fallen into trouble, it is born, the people are born, they grow old, they die, they pass away, and they are reborn. How will an escape be discovered from this suffering of old age and death? And then he proceeds, what, he uses a structural formula, when what exists, does old age and death exist? Through the arising of what does old age and death arise. And then through, he says, through yoniso manasikara, through wise attention or careful attention, he discovered when there is birth, there is old age and death. Through the arising of birth, old age and death occur. Okay, so we have the complete formula on page, in the compendium, the manual, pages 294, 295. And there are two 
orders, two ways of presenting the series of terms. One is called forward order or direct order. This begins with ignorance and then tr traces the series down to its culmination in old age and old age and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. The other way of proceeding is called the reverse presentation or reverse order. Here one begins with old age and death and traces the series backwards. And in the Buddha's account of his enlightenment, when he gives it in the suttas, he begins at the end and then traces backward. And I find this a more convenient way to explore the series. So let us start with the series. Taking the, here I take the definition of terms from the suttas. Okay, so now we can examine the links and see their interrelationship. Okay, so we'll start with aging or old age and death. Okay, so the, the text raises the question, what is old age and death? Then it says it's the aging of the various beings and the various orders or realms of, of, of beings. They're growing old, the breaking of the teeth, the grayness of the hair, wrinkling of skin, the decline of vitality, the degeneration of the faculties. This is called aging, old age. And then Death is the passing away of the various beings from the different orders of beings. They're perishing, breakup, disappearance, mortality, death, the completion of time, the breakup of the aggregates, the laying down of the carcass. This is called death. So joining these two together, they are called aging and death. And then birth, so old age and death occur in dependence upon birth. And so what is birth? The birth of the various beings into the various orders of beings. They're being born, their descent, and usually that means gabbas of a kanti, the descent into the womb, the production, the manifestation of the five aggregates, the obtaining of the six sense bases. This is called birth. And so you can see that these terms are described in very clear, explicit, we call them biological terms. There's been a tendency amongst those who sort of are skeptical of the idea of rebirth to say, ah, what's meant by old age and death, this is just a metaphor for the passing away of states of mind. And what is meant by birth is the arising of states of mind. But, you know, when the Buddha speaks metaphorically, he makes the metaphor, usually makes the metaphor explicit. And when he wants to be straightforward, he'll just state the teaching straightforward. And here we have very straightforward, clear, explicit definitions of these terms. You know, using you know, everyday experience. It's not a state of mind that gets gray hair and broken teeth and wrinkled skin, <laughs> but it's the body. <laughs> and it's not a, a state of mind that, well, states of mind, you could say that they're born, but these words anyway are usually quite definite biological terms. Okay, then we have the next term is existence. So in the formula with existence as condition, there is birth. 
So this is, you know, when you see this initially, it's completely bewildering, you know? How could exist, existence be a condition for birth? Does that mean that existence comes first and then one is born? To understand this, and I have to say, the suttas themselves, strangely, don't give a clear explanation of how existence is a condition for birth. If one looks in the suttas, one will find what is meant by existence. It says simply, there are these three kinds of existence, sense sphere existence, material sphere existence, immaterial sphere existence. This is called existence. So that's all the suttas say about existence. But there's a canonical Abhidhamma text, which is called the Vibhanga, and it gives an explanation which makes, starts to make more explicit what is meant by the way in which existence is a condition for birth. So it says that the bhava existence is of two kinds. There is kama existence. This is in Pali, kama bhava. And there is rebirth existence or re-arising existence. And then it gives definitions of what these terms mean. Okay, what is kama existence? So it explains it with regard to different types of volitional activities or sankharas. Here it's sort of drawing these terms from the suttas. There is meritorious volitional formations. That is when one does good, wholesome deeds, um, practicing generosity, observing precepts, developing the mind in meditation. There is demeritorious volitional formations. Those are the karmas that are created when one engages in any, any kind of unwholesome activities. And then there is what is called imperturbable volitional formations. This is said to be the volitions that are generated when one attains the formless, the immaterial absorptions where the mind becomes extremely tranquil and peaceful and imperturbable. And then more broadly it says all karma leading to existence is also karma existence. Okay, and then it explains rebirth existence to be sense sphere existence, material sphere existence, and immaterial sphere existence. So this is called rebirth existence. So when we take this distinction in types of existence, we could say that it is Kama existence that leads to rebirth existence. And rebirth existence is what is meant by birth. And so the commentaries when they explain what is meant by existence, they put emphasis on the meaning of kama existence. So kama existence means that one is creating karma that leads to any of the three realms of existence. And to see this more schematically, I made up a little file here. Okay, so within the sense sphere, 
we have a distinction between the bad destinations, which are the three bad destinations, the hell realms, the realm of the afflicted spirits, and the animal realm, and the good destinations, which are the human realm, and the six sense sphere heavenly realms. And so the, it's the unwholesome karma, or the volitions that are involved in the ten types of unwholesome deeds, or any of the unwholesome cheetahs that create the karma that leads to the bad destinations, especially of the unwholesome cheetahs, those rooted in greed or in hatred that will lead to the bad destinations. And it's the wholesome karma which is the volitions of the ten courses of wholesome karma or of giving moral conduct and the lower stages of meditation that lead to rebirth into the good destinations of the sense sphere, the human realm or the heavenly realms. Well, we could say that it is the sense sphere wholesome cheetahs that lead to rebirth into the good destinations of the sense sphere. Okay, then somebody develops the four, any of the four jhanas and stabilizes those jhanas so that they are able to preserve them and don't lose them in the course of their life, then those jhanic states of mind are creating very powerful, wholesome volition. Those are powerful cheetahs, the jhana experiences, types of cheetahs, which are creating very powerful, wholesome karma, which are called the fine material sphere, wholesome karma, or wholesome volitions. And that wholesome karma, when it is maintained through the course of a life, then it leads to rebirth into the form realm, or the fine material realm. It's called the Brahma world. Okay, then if somebody develops, goes beyond the, f the jhanas, the form jhanas, and develops the immaterial sphere jhanas, or the formless meditative attainments, that is creating even a subtler type of wholesome karma, which is the wholesome karma in the four wholesome cheetahs of the immaterial sphere. So this is the four immaterial sphere, wholesome volitions. And that karma will, if those attainments are preserved and stabilized through the course of life, that karma will lead to rebirth, to re-arising in the immaterial realm. Any of the four formless, or immaterial planes of existence, the base of the infinity of space, the base of the infinity of consciousness, the base of nothingness, the base of neither perception nor non-perception. And if you want to see the details of this, as worked out according to the Abhidhamma system, you could look just, we'll just briefly glance at pages 212, 213. So 
So if we start on the left, you could see Okay, that 11 of the unwholesome cheetahs will produce rebirth into the woeful. These are the realms of misery, the bad destinations. The restless consciousness is considered too weak to generate rebirth. Okay, then the three rooted, going down to number three, the three rooted superior wholesome types of consciousness actually just take all the types of wholesome consciousness together, they will... Actually, this chart gets... A okay. The wholesome consciousness, taking it all together, will produce rebirth into the sense sphere, blissful or happy realms. That is the realms of human beings and deities. We're on the left side, the left page, 212. Then we go over to page 213. We could see that the first jhana, the second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana, and fifth jhana, this is of the Abhidhamma system, produce rebirth into the different spheres of the form realm. And then when we come to 13, 14, 15, and 16, those are the volitions of the four immaterial meditative attainments. They produce rebirth into the corresponding realm, the realm of infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception nor non-perception. Okay, since the next sequence gets a little complicated, I don't want to start it now. So I'll just ask whether <laughs> there's any questions on what has been covered so far, because we have until 11.20. Okay, Judy and Janice, I see in sequence. Well, Okay, let's take Janice, since the microphone is near there, Sai Jali, and Homian, Yo Igaren. Judy, raise your hand. Hung Li Fasher? Tash. Okay. Um, do all sentient beings have karma? And um, are babies born with karma? And? Are babies born with karma? Okay, two questions here. Do all living beings, sentient beings, create karma? Yeah, through our volitional activities, we create, we create karma, except the arahants, they're living beings, but they don't create any more karma, because all karma, at the base, is conditioned by ignorance and craving, and they've eliminated ignorance and craving. And then, are babies born with karma? Again, this is a sort of question that refers back to you know, material covered in earlier sessions, but very concisely that a person is, as I said, reborn through their karma from, pre pre uh, from previous lives. While they're in the womb, there are even states of consciousness arise which create a very, very weak karma because the being is not yet fully cognizant of what they're doing. But the baby, even as an infant, is creating karma. Like some babies will be maybe by temperament sort of greedy, others will be cranky, whereas other babies will be very bright smile, very loving, very peaceful. So even with their states of mind, they're creating karma. But because they're, my guess is that because they're infants, not fully, they don't have we call clear comprehension of what they're doing, so the karma would not be so strong as that of a person who deliberates and 
deliberates and based on that deliberation engages in an action. Okay, Judy. This um, question is important to me. Um, you had just stated that um, the Buddha discussed rebirth not as a metaphor, but an actual fact. Yeah. So as I was hearing you say that, it made me think of your discussion of faith, in which you said the emotion of faith must be balanced by wisdom. Yeah. So it was confusing for me because it sounded like what in Christianity gets referred to as blind faith, yeah. the idea of rebirth being an actual fact. Okay, this is an interesting question. Okay, what I say is that it's clear, you know, from the discourses, from the suttas, that the Buddha has spoken about rebirth, and he's explained, you know, some of the processes that, or some of the principles that underlie the process of rebirth. And so this is what I would say forms the backdrop to his teaching. The Buddha doesn't say, that, you know, this is the truth, you have to accept, you have to accept this out of faith in me. But he's saying that, you know, this is what I've seen and realized for myself. This is the way things work. And so, through one's own sort of reflection and investigation, you know, maybe we can't see this for ourselves, but if we accept, you know, the Buddha as an enlightened teacher, then we're ready to accept these things that he's enunciated. If, you know, we have some s doubt about this, we're not so ready to accept this. The Buddha even gives teachings that are applicable, he says, right here and now. The most famous example is the Kalama Sutta, where the Kalamas, are, these were not yet disciples of the Buddha, but people who came to him and they were confused. Different teachers are coming through here, teaching different things and we're full of doubt and perplexity. So the Buddha says, put all ideas, all sort of speculations and theories aside, just look into yourself, and when greed, hatred, ignorance arise, is that beneficial or harmful? Then they say that's beneficial. And isn't it the case that when there's greed, hatred, and ignorance, that one kills, steals, commits sexual misconduct, speaks falsely, Yes, and so on this basis, one could see, you know, the immediate, what I call the immediate applicability, immediate relevance or applicability of the teaching. So, if one wishes to practice on that basis, one can, um, and perhaps as one sees the benefit, then we'll come to the conclusion, well, the one who taught this practice and gave this understanding certainly knows what he's talking about. <laughs> and so when he's speaking about rebirth and karma, though it's something I can't see and know for myself, I'm willing to place trust in his teaching. So it's not accepting something blindly, but it's a willingness to accept things that one can't see and know for oneself right now. But the Buddha also teaches a way of practice so that if, when one, if one wants, one can develop the faculties to recollect one's past lives and to see the working of the process of karma. Of course, that requires very high level of development of samadhi. Okay, right next to you, I'm seeing... I'm um, sorry, I just okay. want to make a quick comment about what Judy okay, says. Okay. I, know, I know an acquaintance of mine and he claims to have remembered well, memories of 30,000 years of continuous birth and death. Um, based on what I know about him, I, I believe that he believes that he has that memory, yeah. but I don't really know whether it's a deception of mind. Yeah, I have to or, say, yeah, continue, continue. Or it's, um, how do I say? Like, I don't know whether it's a deception of mind or it's a fact, you know? He's, well, he says it's a pretty painful process and he's pretty, tired of it, but he doesn't know how to get rid of it. You know, it's like a burden. To that live. knowledge is a burden. Yeah. And the process itself is not very happy. It's, yeah. it's very painful. It's like... Yeah. I mean, I don't want to make any judgment about a person that I don't know, but it's very easy to be also to be deluded about <laughs> one's recollection of previous lives. You know, to have, call these fantasies, 
self-indulgent fantasies. Oh, I was the king of France in the 18th, well, not the 18th century, not a very happy period for kings of France. <laughs> Unless you like getting your head cut off by the guillotine. Um, I was the, well, Napoleon didn't die a very happy death either. <laughs> Okay, your, your name is? Bhantiji uh, Vinaya. Vinaya? Vinaya. Vina. Vinaya. Vinaya? Yeah. yeah. Oh, like the discipline. Yes. Oh, excellent, yeah. I have to be a little careful around people <laughs> named Vinaya. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, Bhantiji, while we were on the topic of Kamma, I... Uh, top topic of? Co topic of Kamma. Yeah. I remembered a story where, uh, whereby this, uh, there's a thief, okay, he's into stealing money and one day they, uh, he enters a train and he sees a little girl. He a sees? A little girl. Yeah. And who is wearing, uh, you know, like bracelets or yeah. what we call anklets. And uh, he cannot take them, he wants to steal them because they are like, you know, gold or precious yeah. uh, diamond. He wants to steal them but he cannot unlock them. So he chops off the legs of the girl. Now, you're moving the microphone away. He, he chops off the legs of the girl. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And then when later in his life, when he gets married and he has a girl, he has a daughter, yeah. uh, the daughter cannot walk. Wow. Yeah. So it's like, a, you know, like a kamma comes back. This is an actual story? This was one story. Uh, I mean, I mean, it's an actual something that's an actual fact? Not, not a natural, but oh. story read in one exam that I took in seventh grade. Oh, I see. So it's a fictional story. Yes, it's a okay. fictional story. Okay. Um, now, what I'm trying to understand, consider that this is a kamma, and this was such a strong kamma that it came back in the uh, same life. Yeah. Um, I'm just still trying to understand, Banteji, that where this kamma resides, was this kamma in the mind of that person, or yeah. is it in nature? Where does kamma yeah. reside? I have to say, f from the story, this sounds a bit strange to me, because the thief cuts off the f feet of the girl. Yeah. Now the baby who's born unable to walk, that would have to be the result of her own karma, because we each inherit the results of our own karma. So that can't be the result of the thief's own karma. He'll get his karmic result. But the intricate, the workings of karma, it's said to be so intricate that it's declared, the Buddha declares it to be one of the four imponderable topics. He says, if you try to figure out the working of karma in detail, you might go insane <laughs> from it. <laughs> okay, we should break now for the lunch period, then we come back and go through the rest of the chain of conditions. Uh, may I have your attention? Uh, Reverend Ji Shi, something to announce. Uh,各位,呃,各位学员,我们等一下,一点,吃完中间后,我们一点三十分,就邀请大家到观音殿的前面拍传体照。We uh, uh, probably have the maximum number of people today, so at 1.30, we would like to invite all of you to come here 10 minutes early. Original schedule is 1.40 for meditation. Come here 10 minutes early, 1.30, to take a group picture.